Welcome everyone to the Siddhartha Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology Innovation X Roundtable. Today we will discuss cyber defense, the tremendous opportunities and needs out there in the private sector, and how students and universities can best prepare to have exciting careers in the field. My name is Chris Hufnagel. I have appointments in the School of Law and the School of Information here at UC Berkeley, and I'm the faculty director of the Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity. Today, I am joined by, joined by three deep experts in the field. Victor Fong is CEO and co-founder of Amchain AI. He holds a PhD. Uh, he focuses on Web3 security and intelligence analysis. He's a longtime entrepreneur in the cybersecurity space. He's worked at FireEye, Awake Security, Pivotal, and even EMC. Kate Keene is Senior Vice President of VArmor, a company focused on application relationship management. She has 20 years of experience in the field. Um, she advises companies as a board member, including for companies like Sension, which is focused on machine learning for cybersecurity defense. And then finally, we have Stephen Baraldi, known to some students here already because Stephen teaches here on campus. He is enterprise security architect with HP. He's created and sold a few security startups since 2004, and he has courses in leadership, uh, engineering leadership, AIML, and 5G here at um, um, Berkeley. Welcome everyone. I wanna start right out of the gate with the most important question, and that is what is most important in cybersecurity? I think we should start with Ukraine, Excuse me, we should start with, um, with Stephen, who's going to talk a little bit about um, uh, Ukraine, but I, I thought we should, we should kick things off by talking about what's top on the agenda today. So top of the agenda, and again, we won't talk about Ukraine in specific, but I think it's what keeps us up at night and how we have to administer um, solutions within the context of both our geopolitical and uh, local situations. What we're seeing now is an incredible rise of um, attacks uh, coming on the networks because there is a distracting element geopolitically and there is this conflict. So when you have something like that, we see an incredible increase of either copycat or opportunistic um, people coming in and thinking that our eyes off the ball and now they can come in and, and do some damage. More importantly, we have to weed through all this information and try to understand who's a, a legitimate threat actor and who isn't. So we're, we're seeing a, a huge change. And with the isolation that we've put on uh, certain parties, in this case, Russia, we've seen a long and, and consistent history of them pulling back and now aligning with other uh, countries. And when that happens, and as you see that develop, we're, we're creating a new world order, a new balance, a new access, if you will. And it's that intent that drives a whole different class of cyber security attacks. And we'll have to change the game in the future to come. So. If somebody ever asked me what, what keeps me up at night, um, I never know. It's always something new. Among the things that makes this field so exciting. Kate Keene, please go ahead. You know, I, I completely agree with you, Stephen. And when we were talking in prep, you mentioned, you know, the attacks that are happening right now and, and all of the security kind of distractions that are happening with copycats and things. We're seeing really this concept of a long tail that's coming. And, and what that means is if you look at like the response from CISA, we've had more CVEs, more vulnerabilities in the past 90 days than we've ever had in the history of cybersecurity. And what we're seeing and what keeps me up at night is how do you start to respond to that, both in the public and private sector? How do you know what your blast radius is? How do you start to think about the response, not only from the recommendations from CISA, but the almost daily now new vulnerabilities that are being unleashed on organizations. And the interesting thing is from a copycat perspective is we're seeing this resurgence of what I love to call what's old is new and what's new is old. And what I mean by that is we're seeing threat techniques um, different types of hacks and attacks that are, you know, we haven't seen in the last five, six, seven, sometimes 10 years now resurge. And so understanding your blast rate is understanding how to execute in, a, in really a borderless enterprise and what that means from not only thinking about ransomware, but how you're going to respond, how you're going to live up to what all this new CISA CVEs that are coming out and what you're gonna do with some of the new executive orders, that's all really top of mind and what's keeping us up at night because the, the change is almost daily, if not hourly at this point. Dr. Fong? 
Yeah, so I think um, for me, it's an easy question. We are, we are Enchain AI, we are Web3 security company. Um, so, and then there was a last week, there was a Biden administration just uh, published the executive order on the cryptocurrency. And they already, some of the panelists already touched upon on that, right? So ransomware, guess what? Is using cryptocurrency on the dark web for payment. And then there was a, there's a sanction right now, the sweep sanction on the Russia banks and all that. And guess what? It's not surprising that we will find out very soon that cryptocurrency will be used for, for bypassing and making up of those swift spend, those billions of dollars on loss on liquidations and all that. So Web3 security and then cryptocurrency related kind of risk is actually a, a most critical problem right now in cybersecurity. Um, and this year is probably the watershed year for cybersecurity. That's the start of the Web3 security. Among the things that's so interesting about your responses is how much the technology issues that you are concerned with on a day-to-day -day basis relate to international relations issues. And that perhaps leads into my next question, which surrounds the structural constraints of cybersecurity. Could we back up from the, the, the daily emergency and talk structurally about what makes cybersecurity different than let's say any other type of internet business, whether it's advertising or the other ways people make money online? What makes it special? Maybe we should stick with Victor here and go back in reverse order. Okay, cool. Yeah, happy to answer the question. And uh, in my career, I had the opportunity to work with some of the, my colleagues at Mendian, right? Fire Mendian. And Mendian is known for doing all this uh, hacker attributions and tracking on the nation state APT, the advanced uh, threat, I mean, advanced persistent threat kind of hacker groups, right? So, um. First of all, those are not the high school kids hitting your, your mom's basement, right? They're doing the hacking. It's actually the real deal. Uh, and then, yeah, I mean, that's what I spent my last more than 10 years, cracking down all these uh, most sophisticated hackers, right? So the APT hackers. And it's like, like you already mentioned, it is a very territory or like a geopolitics is always being a, a, a big component of it, right? For example, everybody knows that North Korea and Russia are probably the the behind the, the weaponized ransomware attacks and I mean to keep to keep HP busy, keep V armor busy, keep us busy, right? So they, they 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 are those APT hackers, those first sophisticated ones. So and then I think it's at the end it's all about uh, contextualization, right? So cryptocurrency now as uh, Joe Biden already identified, right? It's actually the big uh, threat to the national security, right? And it's good news is we do have a technology for that. And, and it, it, it is an emerging threat. And the structural constraint of it is really multiple parts. Like one is the, the geo, geo location is a big factor to it, right? And, how, and the second is the technology, we call it the attack surface. So we have the email, we have the firewalls and all that, but, but how about cryptocurrency? How about the financial components of it, right? So the Web3 cryptocurrency is it's adding a new attack surface to this entire cybersecurity game. Can I push on you a little bit on that on that topic? A lot of people out of the gate said cryptocurrencies were going to enable all these decentralized and anonymous transactions. That would seem to be an important structural change to how we basically how we transact. What's the status of that? How do you assess these things? Yeah, it's a great question. Actually, right now, I think there's a Capitol Hill hearing happening right now today, right? So um, touching various to uh, topics on that, right? So, and then, I mean, we... We, we are being, I mean, working with the U.S. government and all that, trying to figure out what's the right technology to bring into the regulation in, in here, right? But one thing for sure is really a technology is going to play a big part into all these different like detections or helping you stay away from the sanctioned bad actors and all that, right? But I mean, right now, I think the Joe Biden's White House uh, executive order actually have a, a very nice framework that everybody should, should take definitely spend some more attention to it, right? So, yeah. I think we'll turn to that a little later in the discussion. Hey, Keen, what do you, um, what do you see as structurally different about cyber? So it's interesting you say that, you know, having been in the industry for a number of years now, 
Um, I always love to say that I'm never an, ox an expert because you always have to be a novice in security. And the security, cybersecurity environment that we see today coming off of especially the geopolitical environment is very different than it was even 10, 20 years ago. And what I mean by that is cybersecurity organizations, cybersecurity for companies is now something that has to be cultural. It has to be something that every employee understands their part in. Because if we don't understand, if the, from the janitor all the way up to the CEO and the board, if they don't understand the role they play within an organization, you are as strong as your weakest link. And the interesting thing is when I look back on the history of cyber and compared to today, it used to be that security was this thing in the corner. It was the afterthought. I mean, I remember my first breaches in my early 20s, literally walking the roofs of data centers with Scotland Yard and, you know, like the MacGyver styled in and, you know, broke into different things. And I remember one of the first CISOs I ever worked with saying, Kate, remember this. It's not what they broke. It's what they left behind. What did they leave behind? And so if you come back and I remember thinking, yeah, 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 yeah. And we were an afterthought. It was something you got to later. Security was the thing you did after everything else in the environment. And today, cyber is now the first thing. It has to be ingrained into every part of an organization if you're going to have a chance to understand and remediate. It's not when you'll be attacked, when you'll be hacked, it's when. It's not the if, it's the when. And that's very different in today's world. I never thought we'd live in a world where you know, terms like ransomware and malware and CVEs would be commonplace news on CNN. And it's very different to now live in this environment where, you know, the walls in essence have come tumbling down and cyber touches every part of our lives. Let me follow up a little bit with you on that. How do you talk about organizations so that they take it as seriously as you say it's required? I mean, it sounds like security has to be on the level of like product quality. Like when I'm shipping my product, I want it to have a sleek, I want it to be sleek, I want it to be beautiful and well packaged. And it seems like security has to be on that level of uh, importance to the, like the deliverable to the consumer. How do you convince companies of that? It's not a question of convincing anymore. I mean, it's it's pretty much table stakes. You you have to. Like if you think about the idea of a risk register, all organizations understand from a board level down the concept of a risk register. You have different areas of risk. You have organizational risk, you have operational risk, you have brand risk, you know, identity risk. There's different levels of risk. And with each risk, there's an appetite for tolerance. And so if you speak to an organization in the concept of risk and the dollars associated with it, it becomes very easy to understand why cyber is important. You know, think about some of the breaches we've had in the past year and some of the big attacks, solar winds. You know, think about that. Think about the, the, the constant CVEs against Microsoft. Think about the other brands that have been impacted this year. Those are brand damaging events that go straight to the board. So it's not a question of fear mongering because that's not our job. Our job is to enable good products and good solutions out in the marketplace, but to educate just like we would in any other area of business, the necessity for understanding the cyber risks associated with the decision-making of how you're going to protect your environment and educate your people. Thank you for that. Stephen, let's return to our original question. What's structurally different about cybersecurity? Well, it depends on how you're applying the solutions. Uh, for instance, we, we've taken it very seriously here at HP, and which is why I came on board. Um, we have even positioned our Wolf Security logo equal to our HP logo. <laughs> and the reason for that is because it is table stakes now, and especially with this work from home environment, it, it just broadens that attack surface to the point where it's stretched as thin as it can possibly be. And when you look at some of the things that we brought up in this previous conversation, um, you know, we've taken a strong approach to isolation and we take a strong approach to, to uh, helping the individual secure the person to secure the enterprise. And, and that's a very different approach, right? Before we were all about moats and castle walls and these kinds of things. But with the advent of uh, malware as a service, I mean, God, whoever thought that that would be a thing, right? <laughs> and cryptocurrency powers that. And um, not only is it as a service, but now we have the tools we use used against us. So we have cartels now with supercomputing 
power. Um, distributed computing power, which has been leveraged for the last five or seven years pretty aggressively. And now with crypto technologies, and I'm not going to talk just about currency, but blockchain in general, you have all sorts of different um, methodologies by which people are doing. And I think the worst of them is, and this is why, again, you know, I think securing the individual helps secure the enterprise, is that they're being targeted in unique and different ways directly. This isn't like before where it was just coming through the gate and you, you know, a couple of people fell off at the front and then eventually it'd work it way in. That's not the way it is anymore. Now it's just like an airdrop straight into the middle of the building and they pick somebody. And the worst thing is, is that with these email attacks now, they're so clever. They're taking dark web information. They're taking hacked information. They're creating emails on your server and sending them to you with neural language processing that says this is the shape of the email and the language seems good. How is an individual supposed to know any of this is uh, legitimate or illegitimate? And then there's a link and oh, by the way, you click it to approve a PL and you've just been fished. So it's this new dynamic that is so frightening <laughs> and frankly, so involved that keeps us up at night. Yeah, let me just emphasize, I've, I've taught consumer law at Cal for a while. Anyone can be tricked. If you think you can't be fooled, if you think you can't be defrauded, let me tell you, smart people get tricked. Any one of us, even those of us who work in security can be tricked by the type of uh, message that Stephen is, is uh, uh, describing. And, and it seems to me the, the other kind of issue that, you, that, that I wanna magnify here is um, we, think about, um, we think of ourselves as shielded in many ways. Uh, for instance, um, armies are generally shielded as in, the individuals, let's say, in an army are generally shielded, their identities and so on. But what we're seeing now are attacks that are counter commander and counter force in the sense of individual people. Like I can figure out who is stationed at so-and-so because I can profile them on LinkedIn and so on. And then I can direct an attack to that person. This is a really different world than I think we've had in the past. I wanna direct the next question to Kate Keen, but before I do so, uh, I want to encourage our, our audience participants, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A function. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, just type, type it on in and we'll, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk. Uh, Kate Keen, in our, in our um, lead up conversations to this panel, we talked a lot about the talent gap. Could you talk a bit about what that is? And then we'll spend some time thinking about how to uh, fill in that gap. Sure, and Chris, just to, before we do that, I wanted to let you know that I have been fooled once in my career. Yep, got fished, it was fabulous. I figured out about halfway through the attack that I was fished. So then I just continued fishing them until I had enough information to turn over a pretty little package to the FBI. It was so much fun. But yeah, I was so mad that they actually caught me. I was like, you gotta be kidding me. I actually fought for that. Oh, I was so mad. So then I just had a lot of fun and went catfishing back. It was way fun. Um, the talent gap is something that we have talked about in cyber till we're blue in the face. Everybody talks about the shortage of qualified people in cyber. I think the last stat was it used to be there's six jobs for every qualified candidate. I think we might be up to eight. Um, I know one uh, friend of mine who uh, runs a large organization is expanding his cyber team by over a thousand, 1000 positions this year. And so the talent gap is you know, how do we get more people, more qualified people into cyber? And what I love to talk about all the time is there's, there is a role for everyone in cyber, whether you're talking about engineering, whether you're talking about business development, marketing, sales, you name it, there are positions within cyber. So one of the things we need to do from an industry perspective is how do we look at this talent gap and create the right type of public private education consortiums to help address the, to the absolute necessity for bringing more people into the industry. Victor, you have some ideas about the talent gap. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I mean, in the past of my, I mean, in the, in the industry, in my in industry experience, I've been interviewing probably like what, thousands of candidates, right? And then, I mean, my last company, <laughs> Mendia is notorious for setting a very high bar on hiring, right? And it's, it's a, they do that for a reason, right? It's simple, it's always supply and demand. And like company, tier one cybersecurity company like Mendia, right? They have to, they're dealing with those APT hackers that I just told you the persona was that like, right? The sophisticated hackers. Um, so when the bar is that high, right? And then there's really, the, the demand is pretty, I mean, it's, 
the bar is super high. So if you set that threshold, it's very hard to find people that you can hire and immediately put on the job, right? Um, and the 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 supply side, right? Like UC Berkeley and all the great college in the in, in the United States here. I mean, you, usually you probably will only teach the students on the like compiler theory if the student decided to go into be compiling a weaponized ransomware or whatever, right? So or 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 you, you learn network computer network and you want to become a SOC analyst that can look at the DPI, the packets, right? So you see there's a clear, there's a huge gap here, especially when you try to solve the real world problem it's for these mission driven com cybersecurity companies here. So I think it's, so what, what I see as being working out pretty nicely was actually, you don't, you don't hire the, the talents that like off the shelf, right? That, but if you kind of expand the time horizon to allow them to learn maybe like one to three months, you look at the potential, right? Within the time horizon of one to three months, can we actually do a good job as an employer, right? Can we give, provide them enough training to get to that level within a short, I mean, one to three months, right? So I think that's actually, going, I mean, I, I'm getting good results on that, especially Enchain AI. We already hired five talents from UC Berkeley. All of them are fresh grad. And I think now we can call some of them are the experts in the Web3 security because we do have a very specific mental program and a training program. And it's most important is to put them on a real world problem. So I think UC Berkeley and, and the, the United States, all this college university system, maybe we should adopt a little bit more. I think that one of the advice is probably to to engage with the industry that the, the companies, right, that bring the real problems. For example, you, I don't think you can get a student that just get an A from a compiler theory and you can throw it right on the job at Mendian to decompile a ransomware. It's it's impossible, right? Because there's a gap between the the theory and the actual real world, the practice. So. But engaging with the industry, like bringing internships or whatever the program, I think that can actually help this talent gap. Yeah, Chris, if I can jump in for a second, I think one of the issues with yeah. the talent gap is, you know, I, I do a lot of mentoring and I see it on both sides. And so we have this huge talent gap as, you know, Victor was just elaborating on as well, but we also have the need for experience within cybersecurity to get those roles. Yeah. So one of the problems that I see on a constant basis is we have young people coming out of university and being unable to get those first jobs because they don't have real world experience. And so we're losing the talent that we're creating because they're not meeting the criteria we want to set for the entry level positions into cyber. So we need to look at some different ways. And a couple of the things that I've seen and, and, and Victor, you were just talking about one of them is you know, working on either internship programs with universities where they get, you know, real world experience, being an analyst, you know, working in cyber, doing something that gives them some of that heads up experience. Yeah. I love some of the government programs. In fact, SISA just came out. I don't know if you saw it last week um, that any person in DHS can go through a 12 week security analyst boot camp. Any person in DHS can go through a 12 week boot camp. That's amazing you know, to get some experience. Um, the other thing that I love is the concept of apprenticeships, that when you come out of university, um, I've seen large companies and startups use this type of process where they do two-year apprenticeships, you know, for X amount, you make a, you know, an entry-level salary, you're put through three to four rotations within the company. You know, if you're an engineer, you do what type of engineering work? Maybe you're working as a SOC analyst. Maybe you're working as a threat hunter. You know, maybe you're working as a sales engineer. And they go through six-month rotations to understand two or three or four positions within a company. You know, for startups, it's great because you train Swiss Army knives to be able to do a bunch of different things, which all startups needs. For large organizations, you're able to show different areas within a business. But the one thing I've always seen be highly successful in these is if they if the people coming into these apprentice programs do a rotation in sales. Don't laugh. Always a rotation in sales, some type of customer facing role. And the reason is, is at the end of the day, security has a tie to ethics. And if you understand from a customer perspective, 
why cyber is important to them, the drivers, that risk profile we talked about, that business impact, you create a much more meaningful employee experience that they will retain throughout their entire career of understanding the customer aspect, the actual human impact that we have as cyber professionals. Would you like to get in on this? You have a dual um, aperture here of right. both working for a major technology company, but also uh, helping us teach Berkeley students. Mm -hmm. How do you how do you see the talent gap problem? Well, you know, I have to commend HP. That's, that's just because I work there. We have an incredible human development program, and we have an incredible uh, internal training program. And I can example that by our print services security group. Um, we, we have been elevating that group, uh, growing that group, and apprenticing people into that group uh, for a number of years. And it has turned out to be a very productive industry relationship and, and an education relationship in that we do recruit from universities. So there's a, the, HP in general is a very good company for that uh, type approach. And I agree with everything that's been said. On the education side, um, my wife's a first grade teacher here in Millbrae. I sit on the junior council uh, advisory board uh, for San Mateo County for education and technology. And I teach at Berkeley. Now, <laughs> what does that tell me? What it tells me is, is we're almost uh, about to come over this, this work from home slash remote education plan. This is a golden opportunity for us to capitalize on that, not lose the momentum and help educate young children in um, a dialogue about security that's interactive with their experience. Because now we have children who are three years old and some of them haven't even been in school before. Uh, and, and yet they've been through two years of curriculum. So as that progresses up the ladder, I, I think we need to stop thinking about cybersecurity as a separate and distinct thing, um, you know, largely to Kate's points, right? They have to be integrated as a conversation. And instead of running somebody through a decompiler class and becoming the next best um, you know, reverse engineer, um, it, it's what impact does decompiling have <laughs> and what are the security vulnerabilities and what are they exposed? If you're a developer, am I thinking about all of the impacts as I develop? And as a CEO, am I asking the right risk management matrix questions? And and I should ask them and I should know them and they should be inculcated at each step, not a separate program where you go in for two semesters and you get your write off and say, yeah, I learned all about uh, decompiling an ML uh, detection analysis. I, it, at the end of the day, that's just one specific knowledge, whereas it has to be, uh, Kate said, part and parcel to the experience. And, and we're just about to either make or break that opportunity given post pandemic um, education models. Let me pick up with something you said and reflect it up, um, Victor. Um, you, you both discussed the, the problem between theory and praxis and uh, whether, uh, whether you know, getting an A in computer science at Berkeley translates to, um, and, and that, that's very, um, so that's a very eye-opening comment to me because uh, it, at Cal, the computer science major is quite competitive, and and you know if you have a high GPA at Cal, that means you are you are a Good. serious business. And yeah. so, me, it sounds like Victor and Kate, you both do a fair amount of screening of resumes. What are the elements of a resume you want to see? Like when when it, it you know I like I would think well I, a lot of A's maybe that's maybe that's the best thing to have on my resume, but what are you all looking at? What, you know, who are the people who get onto the interview pile? And then maybe we could talk about the people who go from interview to hire pile. Victor, hey. do, you, do you want to <laughs> Go ahead, Victor. Yeah. Okay. Tell you. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a great yeah. question. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, so the resume I, I would look at is really, yeah, I mean, getting an A or not is great, but it, I mean, to, I mean, I'm a, I'm a data scientist by training also, right? I want to stick to the data point I've seen. Really, the best cybersecurity professional I work closely with, like those top tier analysts, investigator at Mendian, for example, right? They, they don't, they don't, they don't really graduate from Berkeley, <laughs> but um, they, they pick up the knowledge and in the battlefield, as I would, I would say, right? And then cybersecurity is a technology-centric industry and experience actually play a, a very big role in there, right? And well, but in terms of 
academic training is it important? Absolutely, right? You have to have that analytical mindset. You have to have, like, like uh, Stephen just mentioned, if you want to be a good reverse engineer, you got to understand how compiler work, right? At some point, you're going to see the bottleneck. So I would say, um, because the nature of the cybersecurity is so practical and pragmatic, um, the, the best resume I would look, I'm looking for is really the, have you done relevant projects? And in the, in the interview, I will grill them on how deep they can get, get down to. And can they recognize their weakness? It's always some boundary, like Kay just mentioned, right? No, everybody's a novice in the cybersecurity. We all know that. But do you recognize you, there are some certain area in the, your knowledge that is the bottleneck? Do you recognize that? I think mean, that's actually a lot of them, I'm telling you, maybe half of them, they don't realize that, oh, I'm actually, I need to take a compiler lesson from UC Berkeley, right? So we're, that's the thing I'm checking. So project, what kind of relevant project and how deep they can understand. And then more importantly, the self-review review process, do they know their weakness and do they have the potential? And this all goes back to the, the first set of questions we just we just went over, right? So we, we I think that the cybersecurity industry, the employer, right, should look for the hiring people that has high potential other than, do you have the off the shelf uh, te technology that I can put you and day one, put you on the job? But that, that's actually a pretty big paradigm shift, I would say. Yeah, Kate? So I, I'm gonna um, be honest here. Um, if I were trying to apply for the jobs I have had in the last 20 years, given my college experience, and I did not go to Berkeley, I wish I had. Um, I went to amazing Marquette University, love Marquette. But my um, background is in theology, theater. Uh, my father would say underwater oh. basket weaving and a little bit of politics. So Ooh. zero, because IT really was, I mean, I, I'm from the age of a green screen in the bottom of a dorm and computers mm. kind of all of a sudden we had our first computer lab when I was a senior in college. I come from pre all of it. I remember my first job in IT, I bribed the now new IT major down the hall to teach me what frame relay was, which I'm really dating myself over a case of beer. And in my first interview, I called bandwidth bandwitch to the point that my first boss had tears rolling down his face saying, Ms. Keen, I think it can sell, but if you call it bandwitch one more, I'll fire your ass. Probably could have had a wonderful lawsuit from it. So <laughs> thinking about that, I am the embodiment, you know, I've been an engineer, I've been a CISO, I've been a lot of different things in my career of, to your point, Victor, that desire, that potential. And I'll tell you, yep. one of the things that I think universities need to work on, and this is a statistical fact, I can, I can send anyone who wants the documentation on it, is that women, men will look at a resume or look at a job description. And if they meet 30% of the criteria, they will apply. Women on average have to have at least 80% of the criteria or they qualify themselves out. In cyber, one of the things we need to think about with this talent gap is when I'm looking at a resume, I look for, do they have the desire to want to work in cyber? Do they have, in, yes, for engineering, I need certain skills. You better understand what Camel K was if you're gonna do X. You're gonna need to know what Kube is if you're gonna do Y. You know, like there's certain parameters. But if you are going to be a threat hunter and you are a base level and you are amazing at gaming and gamification, and understand puzzles and problem solving, guess what? I can enable you with the skills to be a great threat hunter. And I'll tell yeah. you, the interesting thing is the times I've taken a chance, uh, the, the apprentice program we were talking about, I had a young woman come through the apprentice program and she sat down in front of me and her background was marketing. Her degree was in marketing from an Ivy League school. And she said, I want to be in cybersecurity. And she wrote a 10 page PowerPoint, like a 10 slide PowerPoint, on why she felt she needed to be empowered to go into a cyber program to understand security so she could effectively take it to the masses. She is now a senior executive at a Fortune 500 company. I had another young woman who was an admin who said, I wanna understand how to be a sales engineer. I love listening to your talks. 
I love listening to what your team does. Could you help? So we put her through every free training under the sun for two years, We've done it twice now and brought her up and they're about, and I have two women now who are sales engineers and cloud engineers based on their own desire. So you need to look for that initiative, that person that wants to go above and beyond. And so from a university, the enablement of understanding the career paths in cyber and that you can take extra classes, you can meet with advisors, you can do things, that it's not a one and done. It's something I think we all need to work on about the creative ways we can get into cyber. Because I'll tell you, on paper, to this day, I'm probably not qualified for any job I've ever held. <laughs> These are great reflections. And before we go to the next question, let me note that we have we have a question in the Q&A from Kumar Balachandran, and I'll invite the panelists to, to look at it. Well, I, I want to reflect back a couple of things that uh, Kate and Victor have said here, because they're so important for students to hear. I, I think it was the Equifax breach several years ago, where it was learned that Equifax's CSO was a music major, and people kind of laughed. And well, I didn't laugh. You know, to be a music major, you have to be a pretty, pretty creative person. You have to be a pretty mm -hmm. um, determined person to sit in a room alone and practice on an instrument forever. Um, and many successful people in cybersecurity are not your typical uh, animals. And I think that um, it's it's something. So what Kate says about um, about where candidates can come from is really important to hear. If you're an English major, you can be a cybersecurity expert, and you have a role to play. Um, uh, um, the skills, and I think it's very important for students to hear this, skills can be learned. Technology is a skill, anyone can learn it. At the law school, I actually, I actually teach law students Python. Today, I'm teaching them regular expressions, and guess what, they can learn it. Um, and even if they say, oh, I don't know any math, you can show them how to um, decompose problems and make sense of them. And if you're a student at Berkeley, we have a wonderful uh, uh, resource known as the D-Lab that offers free, as in zero price, boot camps in Python and in several other critical languages. We also have a site license to LinkedIn's LinkedIn Learning, which has many courses on cybersecurity and programming. To reflect back what Victor talked about, because I think it's really important that we cement this. Yeah. For me, the, the exercise that I have so many students do is to have them do an elevator talk tell me what it is you're working on. Tell me about your project. Tell me about it in less than a minute. And then when that elevator talk is over, I want to hear why. Why are you doing this project? I, I, like oftentimes people do a project, but they can't even really kind of say what problem it is they're working on. Yeah. And then I want to hear them talk about the known unknowns. You've done this project. You know X. You have the known knowns. What are the things you don't know? And where should this project go next? These are the types of things that I try to really get in, um, inculcate in, in my own students. Let's turn to the question from Kumar Balachandran. Does, does any, any of our panelists want to take a, a shot at this about the role of CI and CD, CD uh, processes on uh, mitigation of, of threats? And I'll post these so people can see them. If there are no immediate takers, I, um, I, I'll, yeah. I'll turn back to Stephen and, and we can think more about Kamara's question. Um, what should we be doing at Cal to deal with the problems and the gaps that Victor and Kate have pointed out? Well, I have to say, I, I think a lot of it comes down to empathy, frankly. Um, I think we're so technology heavy and focused for the, because that is the nature of the beast, right? Um, yeah. and the world has gone to computers for efficiencies, productivity gains. And in some respects that is, that is translated into our personal lives. Um, but, but not always, right? So a lot of this technology is at the benefit of our, our employment. Um, and while it is personal, it is still employment driven. And when you do that, you're talking about humans, <laughs> humans involved in the transactions, humans involved in the process. And, and I think all too often uh, universities have, have really pandered to that process in terms of teaching to the test. We, we teach to outcomes, we teach to function, we, we, we move them through a curriculum to a purpose, and that's all very well and good. 
but to answer your questions about the elevator, I mean, that's a great example. What's your pitch? Why are you doing it? What are you changing? Where are you active? But more importantly, what do you want the people to understand from you? What are you bringing to them in terms of the solution? And, and how does that help real people uh, solve real problems? And we're not always empathetic in that regard, right? It's we get buckled down into the, the process and it's, um, I have a new widget and it's fantastic. <laughs> and here's my widget. And, and the consumer gets it and they're like, I just don't know what to do with this. And that's really hard. And then unfortunately, and we're seeing this more and more with uh, pen testing, right? Pen testing, um, penetration testing in terms of phishing is, is not only intrusive because users are getting attacked directly, as we pointed out earlier, but now the companies are forced to penalize them either by insurance constraint or something else. So it's, it's they're sending messages and then it's showing up in your personnel record. It's like, you, I'm sorry, but you've missed six of the last seven pen tests and you're now gonna be restricted and maybe fired. That, that, I, I just don't see any of that being productive. So universities can go a long way in, in teaching empathy, both from the execution side of the business but in certain uh, cases, especially engineering, we do a pretty good job of this uh, in the classes we've worked with, where they, they bring through this, what are you trying to solve for the people and how will it make them feel better uh, when trying to do their job? So, so I think that's my point is it's all about the empathy at some level. Let's turn this focus back onto the students. If, what would you tell students to do? And maybe, maybe Kate, maybe it's natural to start with you you're you know 20 years old maybe you're at berkeley maybe you're at marquette what would you be thinking about doing today to get a job like yours well i think it's a couple of things um and and then uh i saw the questions and i, I reviewed so i can answer a little bit on cicd if we, if we want to go there next what do you do to get a job like mine um i tell people all the time raise your hand and what I mean by that, and I've written some articles on it, is never be afraid to raise your hand for the opportunity and ask the questions, meet the people, understand the problems, take the chance. You know, and what I'm what I talk with with young people about all the time is, you know, a board member, a CISO puts their pants on one leg at a time, just like you. If you want to be a part of our culture, our world ask the questions, ask for the opportunity. I'd like to learn more from you. Can I go to coffee? I want to understand how I can get a role at Mandian. Victor, can I talk with you? You know, it's funny. I was 22 years old. I was in my first job with a company that some of you are going to remember called MCI. And I had the honor and the pleasure to spend the summer holding Vince Cerf's briefcase as he went around the country doing some talks. And I raised my hand and I said, Mr. Surf, could I sit down and talk with you about my career? I love being in technology. And he gave me my first career advice. And I will tell you, every time I've changed jobs since, I send a note to Vint, we sit down and he still mentors me 20 years later. Yeah. Raise your hand if you're a young person. Understand what you want and don't look 10 years out, 20 years out, because guess what? Your world's going to change a thousand times. Look one year, look three years and always maintain a level of what's funny, uncomfortability. If I'm comfortable in my role, then it's time to move. Always challenge, always stretch, raise your hand. So that's what I would say. Now, quickly on the CICD question. Yes, automation is a major part right now of security. We have to do more from a CIDC perspective. Um, here's the key. We're seeing a huge market shift. Um, the static tools of the past that we're looking at, if you think about you know, seams and sores and all sorts of things that we had to care and feed and push information into, here's the problem. It's only as good as the moment of that data. So being able to execute what I lovingly call actionable observability in real time or near real time understanding of processing across the entire blast radius is critical. Um, and so it's something that I think we're gonna see more and more of. And if you're seeing there's a massive uptick in solutioning right now, that's really in the arm is a great example of it, of understanding relationships, user to app, app to app, 
workloads, the exponential almost explosion of interrelational workloads is critical to understand in real time versus point of time. And that goes into the second question about you know, where are we headed with blast radius and what's going on right now from a bond perspective and actionable observability, application relationships and application relationship management as a future service is something that we have to understand more of. So that's the questions. And you're welcome to take it offline with me and I'll address more on it. Stephen, do you wanna uh, chime in on this one? Yeah, and thanks Kate for, uh, I couldn't find the question so I had a hard time. <laughs> <laughs> putting them in my head. So now I found them so I can answer. Um, I kind of like, oh, there, there it is. Um, all right. Yeah. So uh, as far as CICD, uh, yes, Kate's 100% right. Uh, and, and Victor is actually going to be the best person to answer this in the long term, because, you know, ultimately anything you automate is a risk vector. So if you don't play the security game, start to finish inculcated at the beginning, uh, guess what? <laughs> it's going to be exploited. Yeah. So it, it's it's just exploit on scale if you do it wrong. So so don't miss that as part of the conversation. The second question uh, comes into analyzing and and you know is it productive to have thread origins and, and tie things together? Um, 100%, 100%. Um, I think there's a strong marketability for that. I think there's a, a strong reason to pursue it. Uh, but I I would caution that it is also um, again, used as false flag uh, redirects um, when you approach that kind of topic matter where state actors are intentionally redirecting your attention to other uh, things like think of it like a honeypot, but on a socially engineered scale. And um, you, you really wanna target uh, how you're gonna get things done. So as opposed to Kate, and I've spent my life in detection and that group's work, you know, we're all in about isolation and recovery and, and um, survivability. So it, there's a whole different approach you can take. So, and this represents the, the both sides with, you know, Victor being right there in the locking it all up part. I mean, there's, so there's a whole different <laughs> way of looking at it, depending where you want out of the market. Trust me, if you think there's a skills gap, um, there's somebody here who needs your skills. You just have to find the place that suits your, your passion and their need at the time. And I get, yeah, great point. And I can quickly touch on that CICD, right? I mean, it's, yeah, I think right now with the cybersecurity, we're seeing this paradigm shift. It's called the shift left, right? So when you you actually have to move the defense right, all the way to the source, I mean, going down to the development cycle, like CICD, all this continuous integration, continuous deployment and all that is actually, you, you have to have a framework. And now the framework has changed. Like Katie touched upon, right? Like, oh yeah, you, you should assume that when, when you got hacked. And at Mendian, we, we kind of call it, assume the hacker is already in your network. What are you going to do? Other than, oh, I'm going to have a, the best firewall in the world. I'm going to keep this hackers outside of my enterprise, especially with all this cloud. And then now with Web3, you don't even know who is running your smart contract. <laughs> How are you going to defend it, right? So this is going to give uh, some food for thought, right? It's the, the parameters that you are we're talking about in the old days no longer apply. And this is probably why the, the White House is issuing all these uh, executive orders because it is a new territory. And the fun thing about cybersecurity, right? Is really every day you're dealing with new concepts, new technology, new technologies and new threat vectors, new bad actors. All the time, they wake up every morning, boom, like, like a few weeks ago, we get on this uh, Solana Wumpo attack, $200 million. It was because, well, there was just a, a simple bug in the SDK. And but in, in Web3, that's a big deal because the hacker now they can grab $200 million out of it. And now with all this Russia trying to, the exchange based in Russia, maybe trying to bypass the sanction, right? Using cryptocurrency. It's, this is mind blowing and it's a new territory you can get in. And a data point I want to mention here is I'm just looking at the website, the I, ISC just mentioned we still have 2.7 unfilled, uh, uh, 2.7 millions of unfilled jobs in cybersecurity. So if you're a young graduate, you're looking for something that you can spend your rest of your life on, I think cybersecurity, we call it what? Career security, <laughs> not just job security, we call it career security, you will never run out of problems because, because literally because the hackers are also innovating yeah. and it's, it's super fun. And if that's, if you're a creative person, 
especially if you're a musical like me, okay, <laughs> you definitely cybersecurity, it is the right field for you. And, and let me quickly say, you know, before Y2K, I, and, and, and you'll find this in your career if you're in cybersecurity long enough or in computers in general, you know, I can remember literally coding at times and saying, oh, those two date fields, psh, don't need them. We, yeah. we're, we have a constraint, pew. And, and, and then years later, it's like, oh, I, I really thought that computer would no longer be in service. You know, oh, I made that problem. And then years later, I'm, I'm starting web companies and then I'm doing stuff and I'm thinking, oh, I, I, we covered everything. And we just chucked some things for convenience or for purpose that we now have as a security vulnerability. So uh, when you live long enough, you'll be on both sides of the equation, either by hook or by crook. <laughs> yeah, the fact that MIPS yeah. and, and mainframes are still big business, it approves your fact. Um, Kumar, you said something about attestation. So let me quick address that. Um, on the attestation question you had, uh, attestation is important, but uh, embedding it in perimeter security is a little bit problematic today for a couple of reasons. One, if you look at the CVEs, even the one that came out this morning from NIST, which is causing me headaches, um, it bypasses perimeter security. It goes past identity. And if you look at the supply chain attacks that have happened in the past year, that was injected outside the perimeter. It was inside already. So when you think about attestation, always think about it from the perspective of chain of custody, chain of command, because if you can't establish that, the attestation doesn't really matter. It's a question of understanding the relationships and what was actually impacted based on the corruption. So whether that's inside or out, that's where you want to look at the attestation is the relational, the relationships between, again, user workload, workload to app, app to device, and being able to understand in real time what's being impacted. It's a very different picture of attestation because perimeter security is very different than it's ever been. And Chris, I see that Professor Sidhu actually posed a question on the chat. So I take that one. Oh, yes, yes. I was just about to yes. ask. Yes. Hey, hey, Professor Sido, he's actually our, my mentor. He's the one selected my company into the Berkeley Blockchain Accelerator. So, um, yeah. And then he actually teach me how to simplify your elevator pitch. And now I'm also giving back to UC Berkeley. I've been coaching quite a few founders for fundraising. And that's a very important skill set. Focus on the problem, not the technology. Focus on the problem, not the technology. So go back to that question, right? So. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. The, the, uh, Professor Sido was asking, um, yeah, the, the blockchain is that making, because this is now turning the boundary being blurred, right? Based on all these decentralizations and all that, with that making more into a self-governance for every country or, 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 or inter-government kind of collaboration. I think for sure it's in, intergovernmental collaboration. In fact, it's already working that way. Like, in our business, right, the, the anti-money laundry for cryptocurrency, right? So there's a FATF, F-A-T-F, that's an international organization. They are not a regulation body, but they give recommendation how every country can implement the crypto AML or anti-money laundry kind of technique. So, and we'll see it happening. And I think this is, like, like I said, this is why cybersecurity, especially the Web3, right? It's the coolest industry I ever work in. I, my first job after I get my PhD was actually in healthcare. <laughs> and I mean, uh, my background is in machine learning. You can, it's all mathematics, right? You can apply to any domain, but that, that industry is nothing wrong with it, but it's slower, right? But in cybersecurity, like we just talked about, every day when you wake up, there's always something new. So, uh, I mean, it's, it's very cool. And then this part of, and all this regulation, and even the US government are trying to, still trying to figure out what's the best way to regulate this decentralization and now we have nft we have dao we have gen fives all this crazy innovation of fintech or open finance right and web3 cryptocurrency is a foundation to it yeah it's exciting <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a tremendously exciting field let me show something real quick this is the oh, momentum oh, partners yeah. cyberscape <laughs> and you know I hear some different vocalizations there, but let me say for students, this is really valuable because this can help you see that cybersecurity is now a huge field. Uh, there's obviously going to be consolidation. Some of these companies are going to move around and some of them are going to um, eat each other. 
But there's a lot of different opportunity out there, a lot of different types of companies, um, uh, including, you know, small startup companies, mid-sized companies, and then, you know, the, the tech giants like HP and Microsoft and Google, and you can have a good career in any of these, um, um, any of these uh, um, uh, different fields. The other thing I wanted to say uh, in, in, in wrapping up here is I'm gonna put a link in the uh, chat here, uh, the RSA Security Conference, I'm sure all of our panelists go to it, is one of the most wonderful networking opportunities in cybersecurity, it's overwhelming. If you if you go, um, be sure to pack a couple granola bars in your in your pack because it's uh it, it's exhausting. <laughs> it's so big yes. and there's so many people. Well, RSA gives us free passes. So if you're a student, it's called College Day, but in fact, it's open to any student. If you're a uh, if you're a high school student, they'll let you in. If you're a college student, if you're a um, graduate student or a law student, they'll let you in free for that day. Check it out. It's definitely worth a BART trip over to San Francisco. And so we are at time. So I want to say to Stephen, Kate, and Victor, thank you for participating in today's Hidarcha of Innovation Talk. It's been a pleasure to hear your perspectives on your careers. Thank you. It's a great opportunity to talk to you. Appreciate it.